them on. Um, so if we, is Nancy here? Yes, Nancy, yeah. you want to start, kick us off with the public input statement? Sure. The first public input session is a 15 minute session with each person having no longer than three minutes in which to make a statement. But a second public input session may be held at the end of the meeting if allowed by the board chair. The speaker will give his or her name, address and reason for speaking. Public input is designated for district residents, but the board chair may grant non-residents the opportunity to address the board. Statements concerning subject matter that falls under the law regarding executive sessions, for example, matters involving personnel, cannot be made during public input. And I believe you can hit the live stream link on the agenda if you have a comment. All right. So do we have any public we input? We have one piece of public input. This is from Kevin Gray, who is a Berwick resident. Um, okay, so part of tonight's meeting, as I understand, is going to be discussing the return to in-person athletics since the MPA has now pushed the decision to the individual schools. As a parent, coach, and community member, I've seen firsthand the negative mental and physical impacts that are transpiring due to the lack of in-person opportunities. As members of the school board, you have agreed to heed the mission of our district, which is, and I quote, we empower all students to develop enthusiasm for learning, foster confidence through successes and failures, provide services to others, and achieve their personal, social, and academic best, leading to fulfilling and engaged lives for all. By allowing athletics in person, we will be giving them a path that has been blocked for too long. They crave and plead for the opportunity to again develop some enthusiasm for learning that is not through Zoom or Google Meets. Our kids are losing the opportunity to foster and grow true relationships that help them achieve their personal, social, and academic best. I have the utmost confidence that given the opportunity, our athletic department, athletic training staff, and coaches will provide safe environments for our kids, staff, and community. I do not take lightly the decision and constant decisions that your board makes. No matter the answer, your inbox will undoubtedly be peppered with unhappy community members. I ask that you go back to the mission statement and find what is and find what is right for our students. That is our public input for tonight at this point. All right, thank you. Um, the minutes of um, what was the date? Um, um, January 7th. Yep. The one correction I saw is that it says in person and uh, virtual. It was and we're all virtual. Yeah, good catch. Thank you. And I did not have any other, I didn't see anything else. Any um, other comments on the minutes? No, nope. I'd like to make a motion to accept the minutes as amended. This is Joanne. We get a second. I'll second. And can we do a show of hands? So can you just remind me who was not here? Who do, who is? I think everybody's everybody. Yeah. Needs so just going back. Yeah. Can we get a show of hands and maybe board members unmute yourselves? But all in favor? One, two, three. I think that's everyone. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, professional development update. Sure. Good evening. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, just a couple quick um, updates on some professional development. Last Friday, Sue and I attended the annual winter convocation for the Maine School Superintendents Association. And the bulk of that meeting focused on equity. And we had a speaker, Lawrence Alexander, um, come in and talk with um, all of us about um, his work with Carney and Sando Associates for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And then we had some breakout sessions to, um, based on our county by county. So we were with York County and we just spent some time talking about what each of our districts are working through and working on. Um, as far as some equity work. Um, 
the next part that really took up a good amount of time and it was i felt really really positive overall was that we met with um a doctor and um she's um, an epidemiologist from penn state medical center which is in rockport and just talked a, a little bit about what the vaccine um could do and could help with us as we're moving into the fall and um she was really confident that if if things are rolling out and going at the pace that they should be going at that we could certainly uh look at more in person for next year uh, said that masking was probably going to be um the the piece that was going to stay with us the longest mm -hmm. um but there was some definite hope that and some promise that we would be able to look at um, minimizing that social distancing um, as we continue to go through the vaccine. So that was a really positive thing. The depart. Um, let's see, Pender Macon was there from the DOE, uh, just really supportive of that as well. And it just really felt overall very positive for us. So I, I think, Sue, I think I, I left feeling really positive. I think you did as well. Yeah, definitely had some hope that things could be um, a little more normal in the fall, at least being able to see our kids back in the classroom. We might all be masked, but I'm okay with that. That's we okay. Can get the kids in. Yeah. And, you know, no one knows for sure, but that that was her sort of prediction going forward. Right. That's the first time I've heard that. Right. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Ours and, as well. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I have no idea if she was just trying to um, instill some hope in us or if she, I mean, I, she seemed very sincere about what she believed. So um, she's an epidemiologist. We'll go with it, right? That's right. That's what we're going to do for. And then right. we'll be in B, C, and D as well. Hey, Audra, I just have a question. Can you just say the name um, the of the, the Kearney something and associates? And are they, is that a main law firm? What what are they? So it's, his name was Lawrence Alexander. And it was, let me just get the correct. It was... Kearney, Sandow, and Associates, and they're not a law firm. They more do um, just some offer a variety of different kinds of training. And his part of the of what he does is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, so one other thing I wanted to say about that is tomorrow, Sue Shannon and I will be meeting with um, two uh, two consultants from the UNH. Um, Equity and Diversity Department to talk about some of that work that we can do here in here in our district. And we also have a pretty active group at our high school that's working through some of this. And we've um, invited them to come into a future meeting. So uh, we'll kind of wrap that all in a in a neater package for you when we when we invite them in and we talk and that way we'll have some um, more systems wide um, discussions and plans to discuss at that point in time as well. Um, yes, and he's done, um, Lawrence has done a lot of work um, throughout the state of Maine. He lives in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. So he's he's consulted with a few districts up north um, and uh, just a very good speaker, uh, very succinct and, and talked a lot about equity audits and how you would run those in the district and different things like that and how to involve community members um, because it is such a, you know, it's such a complex topic to kind of tease through, you know, peeling some of those layers of that onion apart. So, so that was all really good time well spent. Um, and we're looking forward to the discussion tomorrow with UNH. UNH actually has done some uh, recent work with Dover, the Dover school system. Yeah. Um, really positive feedback on what they've done in Dover. So we're looking forward to hearing from them tomorrow. Yep. So just a couple other things that, that we did discuss at the um, Winter Convocation as well. Um, and this was released a little ahead of that, but just so everybody's aware, Governor Mills released her proposed budget for the 21-22 and 22-23 um, school years. And she has put in a $22.5 million increase in each of those two years. 
uh, for schools. Um, most of that is related to the coronavirus, what we hybrid, in-person and remote learning, as well as getting that base teacher's salary up. Um, so those are her um, goals and her focus. So um, that will go, that's actually going into the appropriations committee and to the education um, committees for review right now. And we should hear some more information on that shortly. But along those lines, um, the good news from that is way in the fall, we were talking about a projected 10% hit to our funding. And right now it's looking closer to a 2% um, over, the, over the time. So we have invited Denise Van Campen in uh, for our next meeting to, to walk us through some of that, to talk about our fund balance and our audits. Um, as well as um, some other things that have come up for school nutrition and, and different parts of, of how we're doing and where we're at at this point in time. Uh, but that's, that's much more hopeful than what we had for information in the fall, which is really great. And we're feeling good about that and some of the funding that we're hearing that we're going to be receiving um, as far part of the, the big CARES Act. Mm -hmm. So the ESSER funds that are coming in for that. So that's um, those pieces of professional development. Next Wednesday, Isabel Ekman from um, Drummond Woodsum is going to be presenting on Title IX for our administrative team. That had been scheduled last week, uh, but we decided we really needed a larger chunk of time um, than just an hour and a half. So she's going to be um, meeting with us for about two and a half to three hours to talk about all the changes to Title IX, uh, as well as run us through some scenarios about what, you know, what is this, you know, is this harassment? What kind of harassment is it? And just kind of running through some um, different kinds of very minute little differences in some of the scenarios, but it will lead to a very rich conversation about how do you approach them based on what you think it is. Uh, so that is going to be time very well spent, and we will update you on that when, when that is complete as well. Um, so those are the professional development pieces. Excellent. Any questions from anyone? Board? Um, okay, donation. We have two donations. We have one that does not really need a motion, uh, but it's um, just want to share it with you that we have received 162 yards of fabric uh, donated to our theater department um, from Andrew Earl of Earl Enterprises in Wyndham, Maine. So that does not need a motion. And then we did receive. Um, a donation for $40 from a sixth grade student. Mm -hmm. um, we received that today with a, a note. So I would like to read you the note um, for this donation. So to whom it concerns, I have decided to donate some of my money I collected last year for my birthday. Last year, instead of presents, I asked for money to donate instead. I wanted to donate it to a veteran foundation, but there were too many things I couldn't do because of my age. So instead, I wanted to donate it to a local foundation that could help my community. I looked through my options and ended up deciding that I wanted to choose the backpack program. So we have received that donation for $40. Wow. Fantastic. What? Very nice. Yeah. Super cool. Oh. And that's the, do we need a, we need a motion to accept that one or no? I, I do. Yeah. And I have a question. I feel like there might be a story behind the fabric. There, <laughs> I don't, love to hear, we don't have the story. We don't have it. We well, don't. I, I think it's a fantastic, donation. fantastic donations. I just, I feel like there's a story somewhere. So if you guys ever find out what that is, I'd love to hear you. Well, I, hope, I hope it's not 162 yards of all the same fabric. It's not, no. <laughs> Used for a set design or something, you know, the yeah. will Costume. do anything and make it into anything. Right. Okay. Yeah, so we don't need black, blue, navy, blue and white paisley, plum, orange, black, uh, pink and blue print and dark gray and orange, black and fine print. So we've got cool. a nice variety there. That's great. 
is the theater program doing anything this year? Are they able to do something remotely or? They have been working through some things that they are trying to do on a smaller scale than a than a huge uh, production. But yes, they are still um, actively working through some of that. Right. Mm -hmm. They actually did have a virtual um, play earlier in the fall. Um, and they just, everybody kind of did their own thing at home and they meshed it together and, and then presented it. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely. Okay. All right. So more donations. Well, thank you for both of those. Those are great. And what is, what was the name of the sixth grader? Yeah, okay. uh, well, we don't have permission to say there. <laughs> to the sixth grader. <laughs> Didn't want to put it out there on YouTube right yet. Right. Sure. <laughs> All right. Um, updates. Sure. So for our first educational update, we're going to just uh, give you a, um, a summary of the latest that we are as far as our hybrid and remote shifts. So we'll start with Shannon Swiger to talk about the elementary K-5, and then Sue and I can talk a little bit about the middle school and high school. Sure, so I can give you a quick update on our K-5 student enrollment for our full remote students. Before the date that families had that opportunity to make a switch, we had a total of 273 K-5 students who were doing full remote. After that date, um, and a couple switches were made, we now have 265 students, K-5, who are full remote. We have a few outliers, but I would say on average, you know, the class size ranges between 18 and 23. And as Sue mentioned during the last board meeting, we're faring a bit better than some other districts in terms of those class sizes. Um, we are offering in some of the grade levels, they have some ed tech support to pull some small groups for reading and math instruction. And as Susan Macri mentioned last board meeting as well, our special education students are receiving their services remotely in addition to some RTI services. So I think we're all holding our breath a little on that date and hoping not too many shifts because it's a, a lot of variables to take into account in terms of what the buildings have capacity for and remote. And I think we're we're faring pretty pretty well and um, the remote teachers are doing a phenomenal job. Shannon, I'm sorry, what was the date, the your cutoff date? Uh, Audra, what was it, January 15th? I can't remember the date. So we passed it. Yeah. Okay. It's ready to switch this week. Upcoming yeah. week. Come, yeah. The 25th is yeah. the change. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Some of our elementary kids have already have already switched though. Right. Yeah. Great. All right. So um, go ahead. You want me to fill in? Well, in terms of the middle school, to be perfectly honest with you, as, as I was listening, I realized that I don't have a total of all of our remote middle school kids right now, just because I have two screens going and I it'll take me too long to find the other one. So anyways, but I can tell you this, um, we were very concerned that we were gonna have a mass changeover from hybrid to remote. And ultimately there was a little bit of a higher number for our middle school than our elementary schools, but um, there were six students that came back from remote into hybrid and 20 students went from hybrid to remote. So there's a changeover of about 14. And Mike and Melinda sat down and figured it all out. So those kids are not actually added to the remote middle school team. They're actually going to be working with the teachers that they currently have in a remote setting. And they've made it so that it's not overwhelming for any of the of the teams. There's like two or three per team. So they spread them out. And um, instead of having them join in to the the current remote team, they decided to keep them with their with their current teachers. And I think probably that's the most beneficial to everybody, um, you know, going forward. And everything was able to work out for transportation for all the switch. Yes. Yeah. It was done a great job. Just, yes. you know, kind of keeping the, it's basically like volleyball in the air. We're just going back and forth and trying to make it all happen. And they've done a great job. Right. And I think, um, at a recent middle school meeting they had the Chris Russo and Brett Saucier, I think it was today, Chris, um, did some training with the staff 
to just get them up to speed on the technology being used that the high school is currently using for the remote piece. And um, I think they're feeling pretty confident that they're going to be able to hit the ground running on Monday. And the high school is a different whole piece. We've had children kind of coming in and out of the remote classrooms, you know, because we don't have a certain school per se, you know, a designated staff for that. So we've been a little more fluid with our high schools. So we really haven't seen a lot of impact um, like we were concerned about the middle school or the K-5 programming. So the right. high school's running. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you, Shannon. Sure thing. Okay. Um, transportation, or with, was that sort of included in that? That was, that was included in that. And one thing that we've had on the our updates for a while has been athletics. And we actually took it off because we were under the guide of yellow, yellow county designation means red athletic designation. And much to, I think, a lot of our surprise, mm -hmm. um, that was changed very recently, very, very recently from the Maine Principals Association. So we in York County and Cumberland County, all the counties are just trying to get our bearings about us to try to um, kind of figure out and tease out what that all means. Mm -hmm. So we spent over the last two days, we've spent quite a bit of time on that. We had a, quite a lengthy meeting with our athletic uh, director, assistant director, Amy Crichton, as well as our athletic trainer. And uh, so we're here to just, Sue's gonna provide the update on that. And we feel like we've got a really solid plan and Amy's gonna jump in on that. Uh, but this is what we would like to uh, just update you on and our thoughts as well. Right. So there's, it, it, within, the, within the county, York County and both Cumberland County as well, there, everybody's um, actually on a little bit of a different page. So it depends on who you talk to, what the plan is. There, there are some, School systems that are in red right now where their their high schools are fully remote, so they might have a different plan than um, the folks that we have outbreaks, you know, so we're considered still an outbreak status, but we haven't had to be completely remote. So we're, we're kind of taking this with um, caution, but moving forward, because as Kevin clearly and very eloquently shared with us on public input, we know that this is an impact for kids. However, um, it's concerning, right? We've been working really hard to keep our kids as safe as they can be or keep, to keep our, keep our protocols really um, in place. So this is just a brand new, uh, how do you do, right? How are we gonna make this happen? So our thought process at this point with your permission and, and thoughts is that we will be looking at um, like a pre preseason next week in terms of getting in-person team meetings together, getting paperwork taken care of, making sure all the prep work is done, having um, coaches meet with their kids and just move forward in that direction so that we can start like everybody's on the same base in terms of information, safety protocols, you know, what's going to happen if you're not masking that kind of stuff. And then the following week we would start with, um, the skills, drills, conditioning, trying to get our kids back and ready. Remember that our students have been out for uh, quite a bit of time. So there are kids that maybe have still been working out and doing what they need to do. And then there are probably some kiddos that are um, gung-ho to get back into it, but might need a little bit more in terms of conditioning. So we're going to, that's, that would be the starting February 1st. That's what we would be working with. Um, we can use, we're going to use the A and the B gym, so we're going to have to schedule things in certain ways, and then we have to make sure that uh, cleaning gets, takes place between practices, so cohorts of kids aren't um, mixing necessarily, so that's that's a bit of a scheduling, um, I won't call it a nightmare, but it's a, it's just, a, it's a scheduling issue, and we'll work through all that. Then the following, um, we're looking, as long as things maintain and we don't have any major outbreaks or anything, the week of February 8th, um, kids will move more into more extensive practices with you know, a little more detail, less of the skill and drill, but more towards the actual, um, the game part of things and in terms of like being able to scrimmage against each other within the team settings, that kind of thing. The, this uh, Currently, we're not looking at 
we're not looking at games yet. Nobody's actually in the county is has figured out all the ADs are working on when the heck are we actually starting a schedule if we even think that that's a good idea. Um, but it, at least getting our kids back on the courts or in, you know, or, or for, so this, this impacts just for your information. We have, um, obviously there's wrestling and there's um, basketball, cheering and um, track, indoor track, right. So those four groups are, who we're kind of focusing on. There's an outside, well, not outside, but our hockey program is a co-op program with uh, multiple towns, multiple district, or yeah, multiple districts. I think that's a conversation that we still need to have regarding whether or not that's something we even want to think about because um, outside of our jurisdiction, we can't really control necessary protocols, things like that. Um, so that's one of the ones that's still on the on the talking talking page for us. Let's see. And basically, guys, we're just going to continue to monitor everything um, week to week. We'll figure out and hope that this does not um, create any unnecessary exposures. Um, I don't, uh, but I but I do believe that there's a strong or we all believe there's a, you know, a strong sense that being able to allow our kids to um, move forward with activities is important. Also, with this, this isn't just about athletics. If we're going to open the door for athletics, then the other extracurriculars need to be addressed and looked at. So Joe and I met this more this afternoon about what would this mean for, for you know, all of the clubs that the we have a game club, we have all kinds of different um, organizations that that get together. So we need to think about like how is that actually even possible. Where would they meet in the building? What would the day look like? Not the day, but the afternoon activities look like. Making sure we can continue to socially distance. Um, there's all kinds of protocols we have, still have to follow. Amy, you might have a better handle on just what are the protocols, for, particularly for athletics. Do you, do you want to speak to that? Um, well, our athletic trainer, Alex, had put together quite a detailed um, list of protocols to follow based off of originally what the MPA came out with, I believe, in the fall. Um, masking at first in the fall was, um, I don't want to say optional, but like when the so when soccer was happening in the beginning, I don't think they had to mask during games. Um, but then all of a sudden, whatever date came around, boom, they did. So um, that's still a clear guideline that uh, masks need to be worn during basketball, during track, all of these things that we would find it hard to keep them on. But it's happening around the state and other states. Um, athletes have been pretty good about it. So making sure that that is happening, um, cleaning in between sessions, like Sue had mentioned, um, distancing when we can, uh, keeping groups to the um, main state guidelines of 50 or under. Um, this will probably mean, again, like uh, we saw in the fall, um, the spectators probably won't happen, um, but um, we have the video capabilities if we get to the point during games to be able to stream events. Um, but attendance is gonna be huge and um, athletics is fully aware of this. Uh, marking who's at each practice, who's at each game. Um, so if contact tracing has to happen, it's going to be pretty much like it happens in our classroom. So one positive case on a team uh, will mean that the whole team, coaches, ref will have to be considered close contacts and do the 10 day quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, so this would take those students out for 10 days, as well as a coach. If a coach is a teacher, that's one thing we have to recognize it might take a teacher away for 10 days. Um, it'll be a little bit different situation because in our classrooms, when we have a case, usually the team, the, the class moves out with the teacher and they continue remotely. This will be a little bit different of something that we have to figure out if the, if it's only the teacher and the, the class is left in the classroom. So, you know, um, we'll just have to take case by case like we do each time. And I do think that this plan, uh, it, I was thinking this afternoon, it really reminds me of how we started back to school. Uh, that first week, we introduced each grade one day at a time. Mm -hmm. We crawled before we walked, and yeah. it seems like this is a similar fashion. Right. Yeah. And just for further information, we have seven current coaches that are current teachers in our district. Yeah. 
and we, yep. right. we, so we spent quite a bit of time talking about logistics and how like for track there's four that are on the tr that coach track so just doing some cohorting there so if one part of the track team has to quarantine then that's impacting one teacher not four yeah. so so we've really given some thought and our athletic department has really given some thought to being very strategic about where the coaches are and where our students are as far as cohorts and I also would like to just say that we um, feel very, very strongly that if a student is not masking, they're not participating that day. If they, they're not going to get three shot, three chances to, um, you know, to rectify. They need to, they need to do the right thing. We need to do the right thing immediately. Yeah. And we don't feel that that's necessarily going to be an issue because our students have done extremely well with that. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is, I, I would agree, I've also seen um, just athletes in general uh, be totally fine wearing masks. I think there are people that want to keep doing their whatever their activity is. Um, but I, I have a question um, about the cameras. And my I didn't realize until partway through the fall when I had heard a question from a parent that there was a cost to that. And... Um, I, you have to subscribe to this service. So I guess I would want, I'm sort of looking for confirmation on that, but then also wondering is there, can we explore options to have that not be the case? I, I it would be one thing if it was a, a gate donation to the team, but I don't really like the idea of having there be a, a financial I don't know. It's just something if we can just maybe check on that. Um, I don't know if it was a per game or per season, but whatever. If we, I would like to just know what that cost is and if there's a way to to deal with that. Um, and then I know that we I know that there um, it, are now some tests available. And I think, Amy, you had said there maybe aren't a ton, but I didn't know if with sports either at the athlete's expense or at our, I mean, there's actually no expense because you can get the test for free, but is there, it, can we somehow incorporate testing into that sports season? You don't have to answer that now, but that's just kind of one initial thought. Um, and then lastly, I agree taking it one day at a time, one step at a time, but I applaud you guys for at least taking even a baby step to get these kids back and I also agree that if we can do it for clubs um it's you know I know it'll be a whole different they'll all look very different but um the especially these high school kids um any bit of sports or clubs will just be enormous for them mm -hmm. okay Amy do you want to touch base on the testing you yeah sure so we got I believe I gave the update the last time about how many tests we actually got versus what I thought. So we were able to, <laughs> we were, we were able to allocate 10% of our student population, not student and staff, because I tried to reach out for that too. Um, so each school basically has a box of 40 rapid Binax Now tests. And those are um, given to us by the state and they are to be used um, if a student comes to us with symptoms during the day. So it's not a pre-screening tool. It's not a send my kid to school sick, go right to the nurse and let's see. Um, so, yep, it's the event during the day. I, we've used together probably just a small handful so far. Um, so far, so good. They've been negative. There was a little bit of paperwork for the parent to fill out. Um, so in our cases, it's been a student comes to the nurse, they fit kind of the criteria, we're gonna be sending them home anyways. And so we call the parent, have a conversation. Um, we say that we've got the test, would you like us to perform it? There will be a little bit of paperwork when you come to retrieve your child and yep, go ahead. And the results are ready within 15 minutes. And oh, so far so good. And they, it's, um, it's not a deep, um, reach to the tickle the brain. It's the anterior part of the nose and um, older students can even actually do it themselves if they like. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, one thing that probably it's important for everybody to know is that we really are not looking at middle school sports right now. We're just looking at the high school. Um, as much as I, you know, we all are understanding that this is a, a long range issue for kiddos. We're really starting at the high school. If this is what's going to, if this is what's coming down the pike for us, we, we just needed to focus there first. Yeah. Any questions or thoughts on from the board on sports? Um, I, I'm in support of, of starting off the way you guys are proposing and just asking that as things get going, the dates that you are giving for uh, each of the each of the stages, um, if you could add an email uh, out to us for updates so we can, and that way if we're meeting every two weeks, we can at least hear about it on our off week. We'll Got it. Yep. Thank you. Um, well, I understand that that athletics are important. Uh, this, <sighs> the vaccines beginning to hit and with the program to get them distributed about to get revamped so it's effective. Yeah. It seems foolish to open the door to further risk at a time when numbers are still rising dramatically and the end is in sight in terms of getting everybody vaccinated. I think that the, the cost of doing this, and I'm not talking financial, is not worth the risk. But I, you know, I know I'm in the minority on the board on this. I just feel that these are not usual circumstances and all of our lives are different than we would like them to be. And wishing that normal is happening isn't going to make it so. Understood. I would, I would just like to say on this that having coached last fall when we started without masks and then we ended up going to masks and nobody was very happy about it, but they did it because they really wanted to play. And, you know, if there's any parent or student that doesn't feel safe, they do not have to play, you know, they, and we had some kids who chose to do that because they were really kind of scared about the whole situation. Um, so I think, you know, for the majority of the kids, especially since kids are probably going to be the last ones to get the vaccination, I don't think we can wait um, until next fall. I think these kids need some kind of socialization with other kids. The problem is that they don't exist in a vacuum and they exist in classrooms with students who are not participating in the sport. They're bringing whatever they've been exposed to back into the schools. The teacher staff are going to be affected as well. Um, the plan sounds lovely, but I just feel that it's foolhardy at this time. Yeah, well, that's that's up for the parents and the students themselves. They, you know, they have to make that decision. So, but their decision then impacts families who don't agree with it. I mean, if, if student A catches something on the team or exposes other people and then goes to class or it's been tested and um, symptoms show up, maybe none of the students get sick, but maybe the teacher does or the teacher brings it home to the you know, immune compromised person at home. <sighs> yes, our priority is the students, but we have to acknowledge that the students are not in school alone and that they are there with other students, they are there with adults. This is a complicated puzzle and we've said before, there are no easy answers, there are no right answers. I just, if, if this were to come to a vote, I would be voting. I want to say just that I support what the school's doing. I think it's very important that these kids have the opportunity and I think it's necessary. I think the kids have, and the parents have the right to make the decision whether they want to participate or not. Uh, in regards to Shira's last comment though, there's no different than these kids getting together outside of school as they're already doing on a regular basis. No different than any of our families going out to Walmart, to the grocery stores and all that stuff. There's, we all have the chance to get exposed at any given time. So I think we're doing a disservice by closing these avenues off for these kids because they emotionally need the support. I think what we're Kevin wrote was fabulous and uh, pretty much said everything I wanted to say in a more elegant way than I probably would have been able to say it. So I think what the school's doing is a good idea. 
Um, uh, I agree with the step process. I'd like to see them get in sooner, but I understand that we need to, you know, take these baby steps to make sure that we are protected as best as we can. What people do Linda, you look like you were, is not uh, is is not the control of the school. Our remit is what happens on school time. I was going to ask if we have any update on when the teachers are getting vaccinated. We don't. Um, the the reality of is is that they changed the order of go basically for um, essential workers and and put the folks that are 70 and up because those are the folks that are having the, the largest, you know, impact. They're, they're being impacted more significantly than, they're, than we are. So we've been moved down a little bit. Um, so the timing, we don't know, honestly, what the timing looks like, except that we're not next in the tier right now. Linda, were you? <laughs> I kept seeing your hand go up. <laughs> Thank you. I actually have two two questions. I wanted to follow up, but a point that I should made. So I'm in I'm in support of taking the baby steps for the athletics as well. But is it possible to? I know there was a deadline for um, parents to choose whether they were going to go remote for this uh, for the spring semester. Is it possible that if a on a case by case basis, if a parent who does not have a child in athletics expresses a concern that I don't want my student in class with an athlete because they are very concerned. Is there a rule where we, an exception can be made on a case-by-case -case basis to allow them to go fully remote? Of course. Yeah. I, was okay. gonna, I don't see a problem with that. We've entertained a lot of um, case-by-case situ -case situations right now, family circumstances or um, okay. Different things. So particularly at the high school, it's it is much more feasible for folks to move in and out of remote because of the fact that we're not. I mean, they're just accessing things remotely rather than a complete change of um, teachers, etc. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to add that that the high school level, these kids have the freedom. I don't want to say freedom, but it's a lot easier for them to go in and out because mm -hmm. it's not like elementary kids. So right. where the sports right. thing is and, and after school activities is really focused on the high school, it mm -hmm. makes it easier for that. So if they have that concern, they can they have that right to opt out. Right. right. And I, I would say, just really quickly, we really don't encourage kids to go in and out because right. it's important for them to be here, at least for the day that they have. Um, but just 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 want to I just want to make sure people know that it's like, oh, no, it's it's not that simple to just be like, oh, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to go in. But next week, I'm not going to. <laughs> right. I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend like putting it out there for that. What I'm saying is, is that option available on a case by case basis if there was a specific concern that came up? Yes. Could we have the option to address it? That's what I'm asking. Absolutely. And secondly, secondly, Ardor, I know that um, Denise had asked about the cost for the video. I'm just curious, um, comparatively, if we didn't imagine didn't have COVID. Do we not charge people to attend athletic events at the high school level? Normally, like if, is it a couple of dollars to attend a game? If it's like a football game, it might be a donation of a couple of dollars, but that money goes as a fundraiser to the team. Um, so there's no, if there's a basketball game and there's no code, they don't charge like $2 to get in? I don't know, Travis, do you know? I, I don't remember paying for when I had to go to games, except for maybe like, homecoming so but. so uh, football you pay pretty much every weekend mm -hmm. uh, the other sports i believe it was on certain days they would you would have to pay certain special events you'd pay and i don't know necessarily if it was a complete fundraiser for the boosters or if it was uh went to the athletic department in general i'm not sure exactly where that money went um, but there was a small you know two to five dollar fee to get in for people Except for students, students didn't have to pay. So and, you know, if there's, a, if there's a cost, that's fine. I just wanted to. I was surprised to hear that there was. You know, sorry, Linda, go ahead. No, I was wondering if that cost was relative to that. So because we didn't, I don't think anyone said unless I missed it, how much we were actually cost uh, charging to watch, watch it online, a game online. If it's a couple of dollars, like they normally charge, fine. But yeah, I would have the same. Concern, Denise, you have of 
how much are we actually charging them? Yeah, I feel like I heard ten dollars. I don't think it was per game, but I'm not really. I don't. I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay, so I just be curious to look the numbers. That's all. Right. We'll too. follow up with that. I think Chris said that um, we have that they they have provided two cameras and the platform for free, but there was a charge. Um, basically, they're paying the direct service, but we'll. We'll follow up and see if okay. there's other ways to do this that are non, you know, that, that don't cost. And uh, there are, he knows better than I do, but he basically just said, you know, there are more cameras and platforms out there that don't charge. So we'll follow up with that and see what we can do. Okay. Okay. Um, just a, a, a couple of other comments, um, you know, and I, I definitely hear all sides of this. Um, I do think that, um, coaches and trainers this past year have, like teachers and everybody else, completely rethought their approach to sports. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this is not like basketball practice where everyone's smushed up against each other. This, you know, my guess is that these coaches are going to have as much time as possible spread out, you know, with all different measures. And I also, I haven't read them recently, but I, I did read all the guidelines from the MPA in the fall and they've really, they've actually changed some of the rules of the games. They've, you know, it was like for soccer, there were no throw-ins, they were kick-ins there. So I, I, I think that there are a lot of, um, these sports are going to look different. I don't know what they're going to do for wrestling because wrestling you still got to wrestle, but like, um, you know, I, I think that with track and probably basketball, you know, my guess is that, um, you know, they're sanitizing the ball, they're doing all sorts of things. So I don't, I don't think that anybody thinks this is going to be a normal version of sports. Mm -hmm. And even if it's 50% of what it would have been in prior years, I do. Um, and I guess, you know, one of my, kind of strong opinions and this is more big level is that being healthy and fit is actually one of the best defenses against all of this anyway and so mm -hmm. i i think that it's um i think a lot of people have patiently waited and i i was surprised <laughs> i sent sue and audra an email saying i just read an article that this was happening like i, I think every article that we did honestly yeah. this, this this came out of the sky yeah. in the past I, I do think that in some extremely abbreviated version anything that, that these kids can do physically will um just have an enormous impact uh and and i think that the precautions that will be in place it, there's certainly no guarantee but um you know, I, I've seen this happen a few different places and they've been able to be successful. Joanne and Lynn. Well, I, I'm thankful that Denise said that about it being the one way to keep the kids healthy is to have them um, I'm doing athletics. I'm concerned about the kids that they're not getting uh, phys ed in school right now because this this is one way to battle it for the, uh, battle the virus with the kids to keep them healthy. So I I thank you for bringing that up, Denise. And I I think the the plan you guys have in place is wonderful. I think going at at um, slow steps is good because you have to have everybody on the same page to know what's going on. I think you guys have a great plan, and I'm thrilled that we're going to move ahead with with athletics for the high school kids well, i right. basically agree with Estrita. um yes sports make the kids fit and healthy but they're not the ones that are likely to get the disease and if they do they're not the ones who are likely to die from it um i think it's more important to keep people in the families and in the community or at higher risk to keep them safe. And I think their lives are more important than kids playing sports. Any other input? I would just say keep us posted then. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, I think we're going into attendance. Yeah. The next piece. Uh, so our student attendance rates have fluctuated between 87% in person, you know, um, present to 96% present. So that's down a little bit from last week and the week uh, prior to vacation. Um, and our staff uh, this week is 92% present to 97% present. Uh, so it started on Monday. We had uh, a hot, like 92% present, and today we had 97% present for staff. So we're going up in the staff area, uh, which was one of our uh, pieces that we continually look at as far as the building and can we staff the buildings and how are our teachers and support staff doing. Um, Roger, can you repeat the um, students' attendance? Because I've yeah. missed the range has is 87 to 96 Thank for you. elementary. Yeah. Yeah. Astrida, you had your hand up? Yeah. Um, how, that seems like a really high number given the situation, honestly. How are these, how, how is the data collected on this? Because um, we're dealing with a very, very, for both staff and students, we're dealing with a very complicated mix. So what do those numbers, where do those numbers actually come from? Um, is it, separated out in person versus at home? Is it on a day-to-day -day basis or is it a number for the week? Do you know what I'm saying? Because it, it, it varies when whether the grade has, you know, a mixed It um, does vary. Presence. So for example, with staff, if they call out sick, they have to put down if it's a sick day, if it's a family illness day, if it's like a full day doctor's appointment, or if there's personal days, I can tell you, for example, for today, uh, we had seven out for COVID related, which doesn't necessarily mean they had it. That includes people that are remote right now due to being close contacts. And we've had um, some maternity and paternity leaves as well. So that's kind of how we um, identify the staff and we pull the numbers every single day of our staff and we look at it that way. Mm -hmm. Similarly with students, we have student fam families call in and they call in um, either saying they're sick or they have an appointment. Um, if they're sick, we push to get information about what they have, why they're sick. Uh, parents will say, you know, we're awaiting a test result. Somebody at home's not feeling well. They may have a sore throat or it could be they have a dentist appointment and it's in right smack in the middle of the day. So we're not going to bring them in, take them out and bring them back. Um, but the nurses are following up with families, especially if the information is a little more vague than what we want or what we need. Is attendance and, taken with every class or just for the day? Because I mean, the students who have blend class. Um, and they're going in and out, um, is it I'm here for, the whole day if I happen to be, you know, counted in the morning, even though I'm here in the afternoon, or how does that work? Well, I can tell you from a parent standpoint, there it's every class. If my okay. kid is I know about it, I get an alert on my phone within five minutes and I yell upstairs and ask him what he's doing. <laughs> but I would almost say if anything, um like if anything, kids get counted absent more due to technical issues that they then have to correct. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, I've had a, just a few times, not too many, but where it's, he's been marked absent, but wasn't, um, I just send an email or call it in, whatever, and correct it. But I, I can't imagine that that happens with every parent all the time. But yeah, there's, it's every, it's every class. And then on the in-person day, it's like a, in the school kind of thing. So it's, it's a, both. Right. And I only say that from a parent standpoint, Audra, you obviously know what the systems are from an admin standpoint. So what I was going to just say for elementary school, like they take the attendance in the morning and then if a student is dismissed, we record that from the, the main office and that we put in um, an infinite campus. So we are tracking that as well. And um, we've talked a little bit about how our remote staff are um, taking attendance and they are still using their process. So these numbers include our remote um, cohorts as well as our in-person hybrid cohorts. Right. Thank you. And I actually feel personally this time of year is always uh, 
like at, at the building level, I just remember like January, February, March with staff. We always saw an increase in staff out at this time. And I think these numbers are tremendous mm -hmm. actually for staff. Jamie, I don't know if you're shaking your head on that one too, but. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I think, yep. So that's it for our educational programming updates for this week. Um, so employment, do we have any employment changes? We don't have any employment changes at this time. Okay. And other, um, I just have a question actually, it's more that maybe we can think about it and talk about it in our next meeting is whether around February vacation, we are looking at any extended out time the same way that we've done it around others. Um, so we don't have to talk about that now, but it's going to be February vacation before we know it. So, so um, we, we have been actually talking about that a little bit, just so you know, but we are also, there's a difference between February break and between Thanksgiving and Christmas where the family gatherings are much more, you know, it, like that's the plan, right? You're going to gather with your family on Thanksgiving and Christmas. We're not necessarily at this point looking to do any changes with, um, um, you know, not not being in school on that Thursday and Friday. The other part of that is, is the kids that have been impacted the greatest are are our ninth graders and 10th graders. So they've missed more time than our 11th and 12th graders in terms of their in person time frame. So we have had some feedback for, from some parents who are super supportive of their own children and, and hoping that we maintain um, the Thursday and Fridays for those kids for as much as we can for the rest of the year and totally get that had a great conversation with a mom last week about it and that would be our goal now as we get closer and we look at things and we'll find out if things are, are if we're maintaining the status quo then we'll be fine if things start to get hot then we'll have to just look at those things and maybe we'll make some changes and it won't be the eighth ninth and tenth graders who get hit but it might be the the middle schoolers that come back Monday, Tuesday kind of thing. So I, flexibility. I see Travis's hand up, but I just want to say, I think we've had a phenomenal year uh, mm -hmm. week. This past week has been phenomenal. Um, I'm trying not to drink jinx us, but yeah, I, you know, <clears throat> crossed. I know Amy's over there. She can <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I agree too. I mean, um, I had just kind of thought of how what you know Sanford went through. Um, they came back the week prior um, to us, and by this time, in, in their time frame, they were closed again already. Uh, so I thought for sure, and just close to take a break, take a breather. Um, they had quite a few cases, and I thought, geez, what are we in for? But we're here now. Um, I say that, and then you know. This weekend, we know. Sue Audrey and I might be meeting on the Google chat uh, quite a bit, but um, yeah, it's. Uh, I think parents are being really cautious. Um, Audra's letter, I think before we came back, which said, um, you know, if, you know, please be cautious, please help us out. If someone in your family is being tested, keep the kid out a day or two till we hear back. And I think that's really saved us in a lot of cases. Travis. So my question was actually going to be either to Audra or Amy. Do we have a status of where we're at for cases and all that stuff in the district? Um, what like what do you mean? Like I I keep track of every one of them. But... Well, I mean, like what do we have for active? Like it's like you guys just said, it's been a very nice week and yeah. I have my phone hasn't been going off. You're right. You're right. Well, the last... You know where we're at. Like are we have we not had a whole lot? Or I mean obviously no. we haven't had a lot because we haven't got notified, but Right. So the ones, do we have out there and stuff. Right. So the ones you've been notified are the ones that uh, we had to move people remotely. Other than that, the ones that we've gotten have not yet come back to school. Um, so the family had been, you know, knowing something's been brewing in their family from when we were on break. And so they kept the students home. Students came back positive, but they had not yet been in our buildings. Um, so we have had affected individuals, but um the bulk of them aren't even going to show up on our radar at the state level because they weren't in school the two weeks prior to infection or exposure their exposure period is our high school still in the outbreak status or did we get rid of that finally 
that no, we're still there. The CDC hasn't called me to tell me that they've taken us off um, the last time. I think it was the the Elk School that was um, the last one to be removed. I got that nice phone call from my friend at the CDC, but she hasn't called me about high school yet. Hmm. And I think that's um, just what Amy said. It's a real testament to our community that we have had a few um, situations where families have kept their children because they know things are kind of going on in the house. And um, that is really, really helping us through all this right now. Right. And I do also think that the um, staggered schedule at the high school level, having um, some grade levels in only one or two days a week, um, you know, the child might have been on Wednesday, but then, you know, was sick that following Sunday, tested on Monday. And so the last time they were in school was the previous Wednesday. So um, even though they might have tested positive, they weren't in our building within 48 hours prior to symptoms onset or testing positive. Yeah, big round of applause to the families and the community for totally. doing yeah. their part. Yep. Any other others? I think the only other that I wanted to just mention would be that um, 